today we're going to talk a little bit about typography, give you a bit of an introduction to this really important graphic design element. And unfortunately, we don't have time to get too much in depth into typography. We'll have today's lecture. We will talk a little bit in class and kind of go through uh, some of the some of the um, uh, different tools and, and uh, techniques for manipulating typography in the Adobe applications. And you get a little bit of an introduction to it in, in COM 317 Digital Foundations as well. Um, but that's about really all we, we can really fit in in our curriculum right now in terms of typography, which is a bit of a shame because let's say you were a graphic design major at CSUF or pretty much any other university in the country, you would probably have nine credit hours to take just in typography. So three semester long classes would be devoted entirely to typography because it's just that important as one of your design elements. So what I hope to do today is kind of introduce you to some of the concepts of typography, uh, some of the terminology, some of the things to look at and consider when you're making typographic choices and hopefully pique your interest a little bit so that as you are using type in your projects in this class and in the months and years to come, you'll be, you'll be motivated to kind of learn more about how to use typography and the foundations of typography because it really is uh, an incredibly important design element and one that we have to use very purposefully in advertising. It all started in 1440. So who is this dude, you might ask? This is Johann Gutenberg, and you've probably heard of the famous Gutenberg Bible, which was printed in 1440. And a lot of people uh, have historically kind of credited um, the really the, the beginnings of typography as, as kind of a discipline to this date because the Gutenberg Bible represented the first book that was printed using printing plates that were constructed with movable type. And that was really Gutenberg's big contribu contribution to not just printing, but really the development of literacy uh, in this time period because it became much cheaper and just much more able to uh, printers were much more able to produce books, to mass produce books and documents so that people could read. Um, and, and a lot of that did start with, with Gutenberg. Did typography start with Duten Gutenberg? No, it really didn't. Typography dates back much, much earlier. The history of, of letter forms uh, really dates back to kind of the, the history of writing. Um, in what in Eastern cultures, Eastern cultures have have their own rich tradition of the development of of characters and letter forms. A lot of which predates uh, the development of writing in Western cultures. I'm going to focus on Western cultures here for a few minutes because it's the development of those letter forms that is directly linked to the typographic characters that we recognize today in English. So in Western cultures, the earliest writings um, that are known to archaeologists and anthropologists were forms of writing that are known as iconography. In other words, they were pictorial letter forms. And one of the prime and oldest examples is Sumerian cuneiform. And under an iconographic writing system, it's symbol-based. So, for example, a circle could represent the sun, but it means not just sun, it could represent things that we associate with the sun, the movement of time, light, deities, and so forth. These symbols were just that. They were, they were visual symbols. They were not phonetic sounds. Okay, so if you look at this table over here, um, the first column kind of shows how uh, Sumerian cuneiforms looked about 5,500 years ago. And you can kind of see the abstraction that this looks like a sun, this, this looks like stars, 
the, these look like mountains. This looks like a person kind of laying down. This looks like an ox. Here's the horn, a fish, and so on. You can, you can see there's enough of a correspondence between the symbol, even though it's abstract, and the thing that it represents. And as these cuneiforms kind of developed over time, uh, about a thousand years later, later, the archaic cuneiform, you can see that they're starting to become more abstract, and then more abstract still, until we get to the late Babylonian period, which would have been about 2,500 years ago. This is, what is kind of how these symbols had evolved. They're still uh, visual symbols, and they're still non-phonetic. They've just kind of grown more abstract over time. Phonetic alphabets in other words, symbols that were associated with sounds that the human voice can make. Those started with the Phoenicians, hence they're called phonetic, um, and the Hebrew, Hebrews. Uh, the Hebrews and the Phoenicians both had symbols for consonant sounds that we would make. And then somewhat later, the Greeks came along and adapted some of these uh, phonetic sound systems and added vowels. So kind of the timeline for the development of the phonetic alphabets. Um, the Phoenicians and the Hebrews, uh, who were very close to each other geographically, uh, they really started developing their kind of alphabet systems about 3,000 years ago. Uh, the ancient Aramaics, about the same time. Uh, the Greeks, also about the same time as the Aramaics. And then the, uh, the ancient Nabataeans, uh, a little bit more recently, maybe about 20, 2,300 years ago. Okay, let's kind of look at these um, these different civilizations that were developing phonetic alphabets, kind of in a, in a geographical context. And you know, if you look at this this uh, map of the uh, Roman Empire from about 2,000, you know, the, the dimensions of the boundaries of the Roman Empire from about 2,000 years ago, the ancient Phoenicians would have been living in this in this area right in here around uh, Damascus, Palmyra, uh, Sidon, and Tyre. These, are, these would be areas that are now modern-day Lebanon to the south and southern Syria. Um, the Hebrews, of course, would be down here in what would be modern-day Israel, kind of into the southern parts of Lebanon and into what we would now know as, as Israel. Um, the Aramaics, their civilization was centered in ancient Mesopotamia. And so the areas of like Babylon and near the, uh, near kind of the, the deltas for the uh, Tigris and Euphrates River, often kind of thought of the birthplace of civilization. And then the Greeks, of course, would have been over, over in this area, in the, around Athens and the Greek islands around there. And the ancient Nabataeans, would have been down in this area around what uh, what is now Petra, uh, Petra, Jordan. Um, one of the things we can see, though, is that at least in the in the case of the Phoenicians, and the Greeks, and the Hebrews, that the the common denominator for those cultures was that they were Mediterranean Sea civilizations. And what happened was that while these were separate and distinct cultures, all of these cultures were trading with each other across the Mediterranean. And not just the Greeks and the, and the Hebrews and, and, and the Phoenicians, but all the way over to the, the Romans and even in the areas that would be now modern day France and Spain and Portugal, and across down here into what would be modern day uh, Morocco, and then going over toward you know, Algeria and Tunisia and Libya and on into Egypt. All of these civilizations were sailing the Mediterranean and trading with each other. And the cross-influence, the cross-fertilization of each other's language became a very natural evolution of how, how these languages developed. And these phonetic writing systems enabled these cultures to really conduct their business, to trade. So a lot of this a lot of the impetus for the development of, of written language and phonetic symbols really had as much, if not more, to do with trade than often the ancient religious scripts and things like that that we tend to associate with the development of language.
And here's kind of what these areas look like. Uh, this photo is taken um, at the ruins of Um Kais, uh, an ancient uh, Roman civil civilization and, and uh, city uh, a little northwest of Irba, Jordan. And this is overlooking the Sea of Galilee. So if we, at this area, you're in Jordan. If you look kind of to the north, you would be looking into Syria. If you look across there, you're looking into Lebanon. So the, this would be the area, kind of the southern area, where the Phoenicians were, were located. And then down there to the left would be into the um, uh, into Israel and where the Hebrews were located. Uh, this is a shot of the um, of the treasury at ancient Petra, uh, which is where the uh, ancient Nabataeans uh, had their civilization. Okay, so let's move from kind of uh, looking at those ancient uh, civilizations just on their own to more of how the writing systems that they developed influenced the writing systems that, that we recognize today. And there were kind of two distinct diversions, I guess, in, in terms of the style of writing, um, the Greeks and the Romans. And it's kind of an important distinction because we still call certain kinds of type Greek type and certain other kinds of type Roman type. And in particular, the characteristic of the Greek writing, phonetic writing system, or the Greek alphabet, was that the, the characters were drawn with smooth and angular strokes, kind of like stencils into papyrus kind of thing. The Romans came along a little bit later, and they started to add weights and, and kind of ballast and, and anchors to their letter forms, which we would now recognize as serifs. Okay, so here's a, 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 an image of what the Greek alphabet looked like about 2,500 years ago. And you can recognize many of those characters, right? But, you, but the more important thing is to see kind of those smooth, angular strokes that created the characters. And at about the same time period, we see that the Roman alphabet looks really quite similar in terms of the style of characters. But if we move forward just a few hundred years, about 300 years or so, this is what the Roman alphabet started to look like. And we can see those serifs. We can see variations in the stroke. And, and some archaeologists and, and uh, ethnographers believe that these weights that they put on the, the terminal ends of the characters helped make these horizontal lines look more perfectly horizontal, that that might have been some of the reasoning for it. All right, let's look now at the kind of the categories of, of modern type and the ways in which we kind of classify it and, and recognize it. And the first category we want to look at is the serifs, uh, also called the Romans, because they originally developed it. And if we look at a typical Roman or serif typeface, as this one, we can see some distinguishing characteristics. First, the, the width of the strokes. So if we look at, say, the, the letter I here, the stem is much thicker than the serifs on the base, right? Or the stem on the K is thicker than this bar going up on the small part of the K. Um, the O, of course, it has wider uh, stroke areas kind of on the sides, thin stroke areas near the top and the bottom. So that's a distinguishing characteristic of the Roman typefaces. And then, of course, we have what they're, what they're named for. We have the serifs. These are terminal points added to the ends of the letter. So these things that you see here at the feet on the H and the I and so on, these hooks that we see uh, on the ascenders of the, uh, the tall lowercase letters, those are all serifs. The thinking, and it's not just thinking, there's, there's a lot of good uh, psycholinguistic research to support this, this claim, is that these, these kinds of typefaces tend to be much more legible when you have a lot of text that goes together, say, you know, text in a chapter in a book or, or in a newspaper or a very long copy block in an advertisement. And the thinking is that it's these terminal points that kind of help our eyes more quickly and more accurately uh, judge kind of those orthographic contours and make inferences about what those letters are. And so we can read a little bit faster and with a little bit better accuracy when 
when we have a lot of text bunched together if they're these kinds of serif uh, typefaces. Within the serif typefaces, there are kind of three main subcategories. The first is the old style, uh, second is the transitional, and the third is the modern. And you can see kind of the dates in which these were first kind of developed. The main distinguishing characteristics, there are two between the old style as we go, as we kind of gradually go from old style to modern. The first distinguishing characteristic is that if we look at the modern, say, Dito and Bodoni, those thin strokes of the characters are really, really thin, much more so than, say, in Caslon and Palatino. While there is difference here in the thickness of the strokes, it becomes much more uh, extreme in the modern typefaces and somewhere in the middle in these transitionals. And one of the things is this makes these modern type uh, modern type Romans a little bit more difficult to read, particularly if they have a color background or if it's white type on a black background, things like that, because these thin strokes sometimes almost tend to disappear uh, in small font sizes. The other distinguishing characteristic of these subcategories is what's called the vertical stress. And it's probably a little hard to see on this, sli on this slide, but if you look at the O's on Palatino and, and Caslon, you can see that it's not a straight up and down stress in terms of where the thin point points are. It kind of has a little bit of a diagonal stress to it. Whereas if we look at Bodoni and Dido, that vertical stress is perfectly vertical. And so there's a little bit less angularity in the modern typefaces. And the transitional again are somewhere, somewhere in between. The next category we want to look at are the sans serif typefaces. Sans means without. So the sans serifs are without serifs. So here's our serif, Roman typeface again, and then right below it, this is a sans serif. Okay, so we can immediately see that there are no ser uh, serifs at the terminal point. So that's probably the most obvious distinguishing characteristic between a serif and a sans serif. But the other uh, distinguishing characteristic is that the stroke width of sans serif typefaces tends to be much more uniform. It's not perfectly uniform. You can see that there are somewhat thinner parts and somewhat thicker parts, but compared to a serif typeface, these, these strokes are much more, much less variation in the thickness. They're, they're much more uniform. Trying to read a really long copy block or trying to read page after page of small type uh, is somewhat more difficult in a sans serif typeface. There are some things we do in terms of advertising copy where we might use sans serifs, um, some things to do we can do to make the type a little bit less monotonous, such as using more space between the lines, uh, more pull-out quotes and break, the ways of breaking up the copy, but it is a little bit more difficult to read. There's also some research that, uh, in Western cultures that, that indicates that our memory for letters, our, our iconic memory, which is our, our memory of visuals, that our iconic memory for letter forms is probably more linked to sans serif typefaces than serif typefaces. And one plausible explanation for that is when you when you were just an emerging reader, perhaps when you were in kindergarten and you, you were learning to write your letters as well as recognize letters, you weren't writing serifs. You were doing basic, straight, uniform strokes. And that may influence why, why our memory for those letter forms is actually a little bit better for sans serifs because we, we learned those at a much younger age. The next category is called the slab serifs. And a slab serif is kind of a mix between a serif and a sans serif. It does have serifs, but the serifs are kind of blocks. And it does also, a uh, characteristic of a sans serif, it has fairly uniform letter strokes. So here's an example of a well-known and, and widely used slab serif, Rockwell. And you can see here that the stroke width is very consistent throughout, you know, most of the, uh, most parts of the character, but it has these terminal points 
which are blocks or slabs. Um, these are sometimes you'll hear, hear slab serifs referred to as Egyptian typefaces because that's where some of the first ones were developed. But as you can see, they are kind of a mix between a serif and a sans serif. That makes them actually a difficult typeface to combine with other typefaces because they're, they're similar to both serifs and, and sans serifs. And usually when you are trying to, to put two typefaces together, you're looking for more contrast than, than similarity. Okay, some other subcategories of type or categories of type would include black letter. Black letters kind of look like this. They have kind of an old English feel to them. Uh, not a lot of use for them unless you are maybe designing a, uh, a label for, you know, some kind of a, uh, some kind of an English beer or uh, a menu for a pub or something like that. Uh, but they have this, this definitely old and antiquish, but certainly a Western Europe or kind of English look to them. Another category is called the calligraphic. And calligraphic typefaces are calligraphy. They are designed to look very much like handwriting, even though they're obviously not handwritten. Um, Apple chanceries, chancery typefaces uh, also have a little bit of, are usually uh, categorized as calligraphy or calligraphic typefaces because these flourishes kind of make them look a little bit more hand drawn than, than say, uh, a Blackmore or, uh, you know, or a, a Roman typeface. And then we have the whole big other kind of catch-all category called miscellaneous typefaces or decorative typefaces. And there are literally thousands and thousands of them out, out there that you can find. They tend to be a very limited utility, usually reserved for logos, headlines, not often used at all for, um, uh, for body copy because their legibility is usually... Um, is usually not as good. The regularity of the characters is not as good. They're just, they're not designed to be text faces. They're designed to be decoration. And so you have to keep that in mind when you use them. Many of these typefaces um, will be very dated. They'll be popular and kind of faddish for a few years. And then, you know, five years later, if you see a logo done in that style, it suddenly looks very, very dated. So Party is a good example of one that's recently been uh, a popular um, decorative typeface. Uh, phosphate, that's when, that one's been around for a long time and it's, it's, uh, uh, it has its utility. It has the kind of a neon look to it. Um, giddy up. Um, if, if there is a good reason to use giddy up, I don't know what it is. Um, but a lot of these typefaces are out there. Um, tread carefully with them would be my advice. Okay, so we've talked about the main categories of type. Now we want to kind of classify them within, within categories or kind of move down the hierarchy a little bit. And kind of the next phases of classification would be after category, we talk about type in terms of families, series, and fonts. Family is the name of the typeface. Um, it's, it's what we often call the font. You will hear people say, what font did you use for, for that headline or something like that? And what we really mean is family. So we, all of us tend to use the word font kind of incorrectly. They, they actually, the correct term for the name of a typeface is the family, kind of like your last name is your family name. Within a family, there are series, and series are the variations within the family. So those are all the different family members, right? And one of the things you want to look for when you are choosing typefaces, especially for a campaign, is you want to choose typefaces that have pretty extensive sets of series. You can usually get that through your Adobe Type Kit or your Adobe Type Fonts, uh, where you can choose many different series. And so Examples of series would be like the bold, the italic, the regular, the semi-bold, the black, the light, the ultralight, and some of those would be available in italic as well as straight case. Those are all the different series. And then font, those are all the different variations of the series or the entire set of characters in a specific point size. So font re refers to point size. 
12 point, 11 point, what we typically use for body copy, even 10 point, 36 point for headlines and things of that nature. All right, there's a lot of terminology that you kind of need to just start to get familiar with, with when it comes to typography because if you're working in the communications field and the advertising field, uh, you're gonna, you are going to run across these terms. And so it's good to kind of start to get an understanding of what they mean. And, and, and there's a lot of specificity when it comes to uh, describing type. Ligatures. Okay, ligatures are special combinations of letters, and these are the main ligatures, F-I, F-F-I, F-L, F-F-L, F-T, and F-F-T. Not all typefaces have all these ligatures, but most of your well-established typefaces that are designed by foundry designers uh, do have at least a partial set of ligatures. And ligatures are, these letters are combined. You can see that like on this F-F-I, the characteristic is that you get a crossbar that goes all the way across, and this it essentially forms one character out of it, and the dot on the I disappears. Um, that's a ligature. You, as the layout artist or the art director, decide whether or not you are using ligatures or not. And I'll show you kind of at the end of this presentation where you can turn those on and off in your Adobe applications. But in general, you would use ligatures, they have a much more serious and formal look. So if that's the look you're going for in a campaign, you're much more likely to use ligatures. If you want it to be light and informal, you'd be more likely to turn off the ligatures. Glyphs is the term that we use for all these other specialty characters that come with a, t uh, with a font. With, a, with all the all the character set in a specific point size. And so these include things like your registration marks and trademarks, uh, temperature, uh, currency marks, and then all these additional characters that will appear in many other languages that are using a Roman-based alphabet, but just don't necessarily occur in English, such as the Enye in Spanish with the tilde over it, or the, or the E with an accent on it. So these are called glyphs, and you need to kind of know where to find those. Next up, we have swashes. Swashes are another type of specialty character that is a really decorative version of a capital letter. Not all typefaces have them, but some of the more extensively designed ones will have swash uh, characters that are available to you. So it's a really exaggerated, um, usually capital letter. They tend to be used like as a drop cap uh, or the very first letter of a page or of a headline or of a copy block, you know, kind of like, um, kind of like sometimes in, in old style chapter books, how the very first letter of a chapter would be a block unto itself. That's usually kind of the purpose of a, uh, and function of a, of a swash character. Oblique. Um, some typefaces, when you are looking through the series, you will see italic, choices, but you also might see oblique. And we tend to look as, think of an oblique as an italic, but it's really not. And so if you look at this graphic here, the normal font style or the regular is straight up and down, and this is its italic, but here is the oblique. And so as you kind of look at the difference, you can see that the italic is much more specifically designed. Um, it has been created um, each character at a time. You see the differences in, say, the F, you know, a little bit more of a flourish there. The differences kind of in the, uh, in kind of the L and how these serifs have a little bit more twist to them. An oblique is simply the normal style kind of turned and skewed. In fact, if you are really uh, in need of something that's going to function like an italic and you're using a typeface that has a very limited set of series, you can kind of make your own oblique by skewing that type in Illustrator. Uh, I'm not saying it's going to be really effective, but it might be something that you could do uh, kind of in a, in a much needed situation. Okay, so here I have some typeset in 60-point Garamond, 
And I've got some lines here that are lines that we use to kind of help understand the size of type and, and maybe even more importantly, the perceived size of type. So the lowest line here is called the descender line. And the descender line is where the descending parts of the lowercase characters, where those touch. So that's the descender line. Now notice there are occasional capital letters that also have descenders. And with most typefaces, those descenders don't go come down quite as far as, say, the descender on a lowercase j or a p or something like that. That's the descender line. The next line up is called the baseline. Okay, and that's where the bottom of the lowercase letters rest and many of the uppercase letters. So the baseline, that, that's a pretty obvious line. Okay, the next line up is called the X line. We'll come back to that in a minute. The next line up is called the A is called the cap line. And you can see with the G, the uppercase G and the uppercase P and the I and the J and so on. That's the line where the uppercase, the tops of the uppercase letters go. And similar to the descenders, that's not quite as high as the ascender line. So the ascender line for most typefaces is the highest. Now there are some typefaces where the cap line and the ascender line are the same, just as the uh, descender line is, is the same for the, for the lower cap. But in most typefaces, the ascender line sits a little bit above the uh, a little bit above the cap line. Now the X line. This is technically it is the line at which the top of the lowercase x hits. Okay, and that's an important measurement. The the distance between the baseline and the x line for a typeface is called its x height, and that has a lot to do with the perceived size of the type. So a typeface with a small x height looks a little bit smaller in the same point size than a typeface with a rather large x height. So let me see if I can illustrate that. So if I take this type, which is now in Garamond, and I select it, and I keep it at 60 point, but let's say I switch it to a different typeface. Let's try Ariel. Ariel has a rather large x height. And you can see that now those letters are higher. So, so Ariel has a higher X height. And that's one of the factors that you want to look at um, when you're choosing typeface. Um, for instance, with body copy, if you choose a typeface that has a, a, a really tall X height, you can probably get away with setting that type a little bit smaller than you could with a typeface that has a small X height. So maybe you could set that at, at 10 point as opposed to 11 point. So these are all important considerations to keep in mind in terms of how the typeface feels, in terms of how big it feels, how heavy it feels. Okay, some more terms here. There are lots of different parts to characters. Uh, typographers pay a lot of attention to these, but for, for your use in terms of choosing typefaces, uh, I think it's kind of important to know some of these terms and then to be able to look at these specific parts across several different typefaces that you are considering because that, that will kind of help you decide just what the right look is that you want for a particular campaign or, or how you want two typefaces to go to. So some of this is, is rather intuitive when you're trying to find two typefaces that go together, but there's so many choices out there that's, that it can be a very difficult decision. And if you kind of know some of these uh, terms for the different parts of characters and you can kind of look at those uh, terms and parts of characters consciously, it will probably help you uh, make some decisions. And so this rounded part of character is called a bowl. The up and down part is called a stem. The interior part of a rounded carrier character is called a counter. Um, an angular part going up is called an arm. Here's our ligature that we talked about a little bit before. Notice the dot on the eye is gone in this ligature. Uh, a terminal is the end of a character. A spine is right here. It's kind of the backbone of it, right? Um, a cinder is this part that sticks up above the X line on some of your taller 
on, on some of the tall lowercase letters. An apex is the very crown of a character right there. Seraph, that's that little tail that's on here. Um, this is called an ear. Most people would just simply call it a seraph, and that's fine if, if you don't really know that, but uh, there are a few characters that have ears on them, so uh, I, guess, uh, I guess we should pay attention to ears and eyes both, huh? Um, this is a crossbar. Right. A finial is kind of the end at a bottom part. Uh, an A cinder line, cap line, X height line, base line, and D cinder line. We've already covered those. These are the most important ones, the ones where the arrows are going, um, at least in terms of my thinking about what's most important for you to know early on in terms of using parts of characters to kind of help you make decisions about types. So things like serifs, um, the bowl, the stem, the counter, the arm, the ligature; those are all pretty important parts uh, that you should that you should be aware of and be able to kind of um, evaluate across different typefaces. Okay, yes, even more terms. Uh, this set of terms, the first ones, have to do with spacing of type, and so kerning is the horizontal space between two individual characters. I'll show you that in an Adobe application in a few minutes. Letting is the vertical space between lines of type and you can increase or decrease that according to kind of what what feel you want. In general for body copy your letting is usually about 20 percent more than the font size that you're working with. So if you're working with 12 point type you probably want at least 14 maybe 15 point letting to get a good reasonable amount of space between those lines so that they don't look too crowded. Letter spacing is also called tracking, but it's similar to kerning in terms of it's dealing with the horizontal space, but where kerning is the space between two individual characters, letter spacing is for a whole selection of, a, say, a whole block of type, a, a paragraph, or a whole line and a headline. You're selecting all these letters, and then you are manipulating the amount of space more or less between characters. That's letter spacing. Weight has to do with the darkness uh, of the different series. And so um, going from the lightest to the darkest would be a, a common uh, series set would be thin, light, regular, pseudo bold or semi bold, then bold and then extra bold or sometimes extra bold is called black. So weight has to do with how heavy, how thick the type is. Justification has to do with how you align uh, d multiple lines of copy. Uh, the most common one is flush left. Um, flush right is probably one of the least commonly used forms of, of justification. And then you would also have fully justified. That's sometimes used in multiple columns of type, like if you have two or three columns on a page and you want both the right and the left side of the column to be uniform and straight, you might want to use fully justified. And then centered, you would never set body copy in centered type, but sometimes you might set headlines or just a couple of lines of type in a centered fashion. So this really has to do more with paragraph styles. Measuring time. Yes, it's a it's a lot of terminology, but um, you know, like most disciplines and technical fields, there is simply a lot of terminology that that goes with it, and you know, it's our obligation to learn it. Agate. Agate is a measurement of type that is five and a half points, or about one 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 fourteenth of an inch. Uh, you don't see it used very often at all in, in digital publications. It's mostly confined to print. And 5.5 points is, is usually considered about the smallest font size that you can use that will still be legible for a typeface that has pretty good readability. And so agate type, think of the, the really fine print that you might see in a pharmaceutical advertisement or, or in the, the fine print at the bottom of a promotion. That's kind of agate type, five and a half points. A Cicero, you're probably not likely to run into that uh, unless you are collaborating with somebody from another country because it's just simply not used in the United States, but it's very similar to a pica. 
And it's much more important that you know what a pica is. A pica is a unit of measurement that is one sixth of an inch. So there are six picas to an inch. And we typically use picas when we talk about the width of columns of type. So pica is usually used for a width measurement for type set in columns. A point, you kind of know what that is in terms of 12 point type, 24 point type, but technically a point is 1 72nd of an inch. So 72 point type is one inch tall from the A center line to the D center line. Okay, so how many typefaces do you typically use in a campaign? And the answer is two, usually. And kind of by default, it's certainly not a rule, but most commonly, those two typefaces, one would be a serif and one would be a sans serif. You're usually looking for typefaces that go together, but that have contrast, kind of like a complementary color scheme, but with type. That's usually kind of the rule of thumb. Um, don't always have to follow that, but kind of keep that in mind as that's, that's a fairly typical way of approaching it. And then you have a third typeface to consider, which is the typeface that's used in the logo. Now, of course, you don't get to change a brand's logo just for your purposes for an advertising campaign, but you do want to make type decisions that will take into account what's going to go with the logo. So if you've got a really light and airy logo, then you probably aren't going to use something like Rockwell Bold for your type because that's a super heavy typeface. So you've got, you do kind of have to keep the branding in mind when you are choosing typefaces to go into a campaign. And typically you want to find a type, find two typefaces that have lots of different series that you can use, which gives you a lot more flexibility then for things like subheadlines or, um, you know, different kinds of weights that you're going to use, say, in a direct mail piece or in your internet advertising or your social media um, banners and things of that nature. All right, let's take a quick look at where you can find some of these things I've just talked about in the Adobe applications. All right, in the Adobe applications, uh, you can get to a lot of these uh, different functions that I just talked about through, through your different type windows. Uh, you can go into your type for your character, character styles, glyphs, um, paragraph styles, and things like that. So I've got a few files open here. Uh, the first one shows you the examples of ligatures versus not having ligatures on. And you can get to the ligatures switch through this open type function. But here on the left, you can see I have ligatures turned on, that F and the L merge. The F and the I um, have, have a crossbar with the dot taken off. The FF here are, uh, are merged. Those are ligatures. Where on the other side here, they are remain as separate characters. Uh, to turn on ligatures, it's, it's fairly simple. You just click on the section of type that you want to uh, either turn the ligatures on or off. You go into your um, open type function right here. And right there is your ligatures switch. So if I turn this on, it puts those ligatures in. If I turn it off, it turns them off. That's ligatures. All right, next let's look at kerning. Kerning, as I said before, is the space between, two, the horizontal space between two characters. And we adjust that in not the open type or the paragraph, but we adjust that in the character window. And so to adjust kerning, so it looks pretty good here in the lowercase version, but if you look at this all caps version of the sentence correct awful spacing, you can tell that, okay, it looks pretty good there between the two R's, but it looks like there's more space between the O and the R. And there's not. It's an illusion that that occurs because of the curve on the O. Same thing here with the space between the A and the W. That looks like a lot of space compared to the space between, say, the U and the L 
or a lot of space here between the P and the A. And so that's where you want to go in and adjust the kerning so that optically they look uniform even though you're actually making them closer together or farther apart uh, than they would be just by, by regular character setting. And so to do, to do that, you select the, the piece of type that you want to adjust. You go into your type tool, and let's do the A and the W here. You put your cursor between the two letters. And then, using your character palette, you come here to, this is the, the V slash A. That is your kerning adjustment. And see what happens there if I set this to, say, minus 50%. See how the A and the W came closer together? And that actually looks pretty good now. Okay, if I try to adjust, say, the, the P and the A, let me try, say, 25%. And it got closer. It looks better, but maybe it's not quite there. So I can do that like a point at a time. And you can kind of slowly see that start to pull in together. And that's how you adjust the kerning. All right, now let's look at uh, how, do you, uh, how you adjust and how you manipulate justification. Okay, so I've got um, a couple of paragraphs of an academic article with a lot of big words and, and um, small body copy. I've got that set in 12-point Garamond. And this is set, of course, in one column. And if I want to change the number of columns, I can select it. Select that block of type, and then go up into my type menu in, in uh, Illustrator and go to my area type options. And if I want to set that in two columns, that's what two columns looks like. Uh, by default, it's going to give you like one pica in between the columns. Uh, if I want to set it in three columns, set it there. And now let's look at the different justification patterns now that we have this set in three columns. So if I go to my paragraph window, I can have these different styles of justification. Now this one is the fully justified. Um, here's the aligned left. And this is a pretty commonly used uh, justification method. Uh, what it does is it gives you really good spacing all through your lines. Um, but if you do have a lot of big words, such as what you have in, in this uh, copy block, and you've got fairly narrow columns, you will end up with perhaps a lot of, uh, a lot of spaces right here. And it doesn't look so bad when it's confined by a bounding box, but if we get rid of that bounding box, sometimes those kind of, sometimes they're called rivers of white space can be a little distracting. So that's that's one of the considerations why you might go with a fully justified as opposed to a uh, flush, uh, flush left. Centered, no, nah, that just, that's just ugly. Uh, you, you just are never going to set body copy all centered. Uh, it makes it very hard for the, for the reader's eye to find the beginnings of the lines and things of that, that nature. Also, when you get short lines, they look really odd and things like that. And your, you know, your widows and orphans look really bad uh, with, with, fully, uh, with centered type. But the only time you'll use centered type would be um, maybe with a two or three line headline. Uh, flush right or a line right, um, you're hardly ever going to use that. Uh, about the only time you might use that is if you want to align a very short copy block against, um, against say, an image, a photograph, or something that's, that's right to the right of it. But rarely would you use that. Uh, so let's look at the, um, the fully justified. And the advantage of the fully justified is you get really neat and crisp um, columns. And so that space between the column looks, looks very uniform. It's attractive to the eye. What is difficult, however, especially in something like this where you've got fairly narrow columns and a lot of big words, is that this justification gives you some odd spacing between those words, something like that, right? And so this would be where you might go in and then uh, select a few lines of type and try to correct some of those problems. And so maybe what you would do is select a few lines right there and see if we can get rid of that 
that big space in the middle of contained, uh, between contained and non-figurative. And so now I'll go to my character palette, and instead of dealing with the kerning, I'm going to deal with the tracking or the letter spacing. And maybe I will set those, let's try down to like 25%. And see, that fixed that problem. Okay. Uh, another thing you might want to look at to adjust tracking, either, either wider or narrower, is to limit the number of hyphenations that you have. Uh, a rule of thumb is that you probably want only about three or fewer hyphenations to a single page of text. Okay, so that's a brief introduction. Well, 50 minutes. You may not think that's brief, but in terms of, uh, in terms of content, uh, that is a pretty brief introduction to concepts of typography and how type is developed, and probably more importantly for you, how do we use type and how do we kind of control type within the Adobe application. So, like I said, that's a, it's a brief introduction. Uh, hopefully it kind of opened your eyes a little bit to the, to the complex world of typography that we, that we kind of have to learn how to, to work in when we are making type decisions for advertising campaigns and branding and things of that nature. There's a lot to it. It's a very, very interesting field, and I encourage you to kind of become a type geek. That's all for now.